Oh man, yeah, Long Shamon, Maldoro and Poems. This, I gotta read this again. This is, uh, this is very influential. This is almost like a, a, a prose poem, horror story, you know, uh, it done in like by like surrealists. Okay, uh, obviously, this guy, it was a, uh, let's say, uh, a uh, pseudonym for a writer, a Frenchman who grew up in Uruguay. Right? He wrote this and he, he, this is all he did. He kind of died like three years later. And that's that, oof, that's that really great painting. But Maldoror, it's like I said, it's basically a vi this, vi this, this horrible, horrible character, Maldoror. This uh, evil villain does these evil things. Uh, but it almost pales in comparison to just like the world that he is in where you see all these bizarre and strange uh, things happen. It really is it's a head trip. Uh, and this is also kind of early. This I think this came out in 1870s. Yeah, yeah, or 1860s. Uh, yeah, this, this influenced a lot of people. And this guy is kind of like a mystery in a way, you know. Uh, yeah, there he is, Maldoror, Master of Disguises, pursued by the police. Right. Uh and you know, and just as crazy is this world that he's in, it's you know, nightmarish realm of it, this pretty much this is a great description of something. Right. So anyway, I'm just gonna read one part of it. Right. You know, you can say, Well, this is not poetry. Right. There exists an insect which men feed at their own expense. They owe it nothing but they fear it. The insect which does not like wine but prefers blood. Would, if its legitimate needs were not satisfied, be capable by means of an occult power of becoming as big as an elephant and of crushing men like ears of corn. And one has to see how respected it is, how it is surrounded with fawning veneration, how it is held in high esteem above all the other animals of creation. The head is given it as its throne and it digs its claws solemnly into the roots of the hair. Later, when it is fat and getting on in age, it is killed following the custom of an ancient race to prevent it from suffering the hardships of old age. It is given a magnificent hero, hero's funeral, the prominent citizens bearing the coffin on their shoulders straight to the grave. Above the damp earth, which the grave digger is shrewdly moving with his spade, multicolored sentences are combined on the immortality of the soul, the emptiness of life. The incomprehensible will of providence and the marble closes forever on this life. Filled with such toil, which is now but a corpse, the crowd disperses, and night soon covers the walls of the cemetery with shadows. But be consoled, human beings, for this grievous loss. Look at his countless family, which he so freely bestowed on you, which is advancing that your despair should be less bitter, should be, so to speak, sweet many surly abortions, which will later grow into magnificent lice of remarkable beauty, monsters of wise demeanor, under its maternal wing, it has incubated several dozen beloved eggs in your hair, dried by the unremitting suction of these fearsome strangers. Now the time has come for the eggs to hatch. Do not fear. These youthful philosophers will soon grow in the course of this ephemeral life. They will grow so much that they will soon make you aware of it with their claws and their suckers. And yet you still do not know why they are not to devour the bones of your head. Why are they satisfied with ceremoniously exacting the quintessence of your blood? Wait a moment, and I will tell you. It's because they do not have the strength. You may be sure that if their jaws conform to the measure of their infinite desires, your brain, the retina of your eyes, your spinal column, and all your body would be consumed, like a drop of water. Take a microscope and examine a louse at work on a beggar's head. You will be surprised. Unfortunately, these plunderers of long hair are tiny. They would be no good for conscription, for they are not of the size which the law requires. They belong to the short-legged Lilliputian world, and the blind do not hesitate to classify them among them the infinitesimally small. But woe to the sperm whale that, for, that fought against the louse. Despite his size, he would be devoured in a trice. Not even his tail would remain to tell the news, and an elephant can be stroked, but not a louse. I would not advise you to try this dangerous experiment. Beware if you have a hairy hand, or even if it is only flesh and bone. Your fingers have had it. They are beyond hope. They will crack as if they were on the rack. By a strange enchantment, the skin disappears. 
Lice are capable of doing as much evil as their imagination contemplates. If you find a louse, go on your way. Do not lick its papilla with your tongue. An accident would happen to you. Cases have been known. Never mind. I'm already content with the amount of harm it has done you, oh human race. But I would like it to do you even more harm. How much longer will you keep up the worm-eaten cult of this god who is insensible to your prayers and to the generous sacrifices that you offer him as an expati- ex- oh boy, expateria holocaust? Yeah. Can you not see that this horrible manatee is not grateful for the bowels of blood and brains which you lay on his altars, piously decorated with garlands of flowers? He is not grateful, for earthquakes and tempests have been raging uninterruptedly since the beginning of all things. And nonetheless, this is a spectacle worthy of observation. The more indifferent he is, the more you admire him. It is clear that you are wary of his attributes, which he hides, and your reasoning is based on the consideration that a divinity of such extreme power can only show such disdain for the faithful who obey the commandments of his religion. For that reason, different gods exist in each country. Here the crocodile, there the prostitute. When it comes to the laos of holy name, the nations of earth, one and all, kissing the chains of their slavery, kneel together in the august sanctuary before the pedestals of this shapeless and bloodthirsty idol. Any people that did not obey its own groveling instincts and made as if to rebel would sooner or later disappear from the face of the earth like an autumn leaf, destroyed by the vengeance of that inexorable god. O Laos of the shriveled up eyes, as long as rivers pour their waters into the depths of the sea, as long as the stars gravitate along their fixed orbits, as long as the dumb emptiness has no horizon, as long as humanity tears its own sides apart with disastrous wars, as long as divine justice hurls its avenging thunderbolts down on this selfish globe, as long as man denies his creator, and not without reason, snaps his fingers at him, combining insolence and disdain, your reign over the universe will be assured, and your dynasty will extend its influence throughout the centuries. I salute you, rising sun, heavenly liberator, you, the invisible enemy of man. Continue to tell lewdness to couple with him in impure embraces, and sweat to him with oaths not written in powder, that she will be his faithful lover until eternity. Kiss from time to time the dress of the great unchaste, in memory of the important services she does not fail to render you. If she did not seduce a man with her lascivious, <laughs> lascivious breast, it is improbable that she would exist. You, the product of this reasonable and logical coupling, O oh, son of lewdness, tell your mother that she abandons man's bed and therefore walks a solitary way alone, and without support she will put your existence at risk and let her fragrant room, womb, which has borne you for nine months, be stirred at the thought of the dangers which her tender fruit so gentle and peaceful, but already cold and savage, would run as a result. Lewdness, queen of empires, keep before my hate-filled eyes the sight of your starving offspring's imperceptible growth. To achieve this goal, you know that you have only to stick more closely to man's sides. And you may do this without compromising modesty, since both of you have been married for a long time. As for me, if it may be permitted to add a few words to this hymn of glorification, I will say that I have had a grave built, 40 square leagues in area of corresponding death. There in its foul virginity lies a living mine of lice. It fills the bottom of the pit, and thence it spreads out in the wide, thick veins in all directions. This is how I built this mine. I pulled the female louse out of the hair of a man. I slept with it for three consecutive nights. Then I threw it into the pit. Destiny saw to it that human fecundation, which would have been impossible in other similar cases, was successful this time. And after a few days, thousands of monsters crawling in a compact mass of matter first saw the light of day. This hideous mass became more and more intense in time, acquiring the liquid property of mercury and branched out to several groups, which at the minute sustained themselves by eating one another, the birth rate being higher than the mortality rate unless I throw them as fodder a newborn bastard whose mother wished its death, or the arm of some young girl which I cut off during the night after drugging her with chloroform. Oof. Every 15 years, the generations of lice which live off men diminish noticeably and infallibly predict the approaching era of their complete destruction. For man, more intelligent than his enemy, has managed to conquer him. 
Then with an infernal spade which increases my strength, I extract blocks of light from this inexhaustible mine, break them up with axe blows, and transport them into the arteries of cities. There they dissolve on contact with human temperatures in the first days of their formation. In the winding galleries of the underground mine, they dig down into the gravel and spread like little streams into the dwelling places of men like malign spirits. The watchdog gives a low bark, for it seems to him that a legion of unknown beings is penetrating the pores of the walls, bringing terror to the bed of sleep. Perhaps at least once in your life, you have heard one of these wailing prolonged barks. With his feeble eyes, he tries to pierce the darkness of the night, for all this passes the understanding of his dog brain. This humming irritates him. He feels he has been betrayed. Millions of the enemies swoop down thus on this, each city like clouds of locusts. That will be enough for 15 years. They will fight against man and inflict sharp wounds on him. After this period, I will send others. When I am smashing the blocks of living matter, it may happen that one fragment is denser than another. These atoms are striving furiously to break off from the agglomeration and go and torment mankind. But the cohesion of the whole is such that it resists all their efforts. In a supreme convulsion, they make such an effort that the block, unable to scatter its living elements, soars right into the air, as if set off by gunpowder, then falls again and buries itself firmly in the ground. Sometimes a pensive peasant sees an aerolith vertically rendering space, moving downwards towards a cornfield. He does not know where the stone comes from. Now you have clearly and succinctly the explanation of the phenomenon. If the face of earth were covered with life as the seashore is covered with grains of sand, the human race would be destroyed, a prey to dreadful pain. What a sight! With me motionless on my angel wings in the air to contemplate it. Oh, man. Dude, this whole thing is like this. It's like a, it's like a madman in Arkham or something, like, talking in his padded cell. Uh, it's creepy. It's just, I don't know. It's really cool. I can imagine... Someone trying to do this, but man, this is a lot of stuff. Really, really cool. And, uh, you know, man, what an evil son of a bitch this guy is. But, you know, it's, uh, it's just, uh, it's not real, right? <laughs> yeah, Maldoror, man. You get, a, I really enjoy this. It's it definitely a mind, uh, probably the least heard about a book that is like this. So, uh, there you go. <laughs> Later.